So I want to start this morning talking a little bit about where we have been as a denomination and where we currently are and where we might be going in the future. Um, as we talk about this, uh, we'll have questions at the end, but uh, just let me get this out as much as we can just for the preservation of time. First and foremost, uh, the United Methodist Church has been in existence since 1968 when the Methodist Church and Evangelical United Brethren uh, came together as one denomination, the United Methodist Church. We made it three years before we had to discuss this. Uh, in 1971, uh, the first openly gay clergy person uh, came out and tried to keep uh, their credentials, their ordination, and that forced the General Conference, which is the gathering of representatives of Methodism from all over the world that meets every four years to make some decisions regarding uh, their stance on issues related to, at that point, just homosexual people, but now uh, LGBTQ, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning people. Um, in 1972, the incompatibility clause was instated in our doctrine, which you can find in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, which is all of our doctrine and polity. Uh, the incompatibility clause simply states that the United Methodist Church uh, believes that uh, homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And then over the course of the last 40 or so years, we have added to, changed, massaged uh, that wording uh, a couple different ways. Uh, we have instated the fact that there can be no uh, openly gay clergy. Uh, we cannot do same-sex marriages in the United Methodist churches. Um, but along with that incompatibility clause, the language was softened a little bit to also acknowledge that all people are of sacred worth and we are called to be in ministry to all people. We have fought, protested, struggled with this issue since 1972, since it was first put into the, into the discipline. Every year at General Conference, people gather together. There are protesters outside, inside the gathering. There is a struggle in our denomination. We are not of one mind when it comes to issues related to human sexuality. But we disagree so much that we can't even agree that we disagree and we are not of one mind when it comes to human sexuality. That was one of the things that they tried to put forward last time is we don't agree on this, but we can't even agree to not agree um, because that's what happens when church and politics combine. Uh, it gets a little messy. So, at the last general conference in 2016, those representatives who came together got so frustrated with the way that we have approached this for the last 30 to 40 years, they said, give us a plan, give us a way forward. So they turned it over to the Council of Bishops, which is all the uh, active and retired bishops in, uh, in the world, and said, you come up with a plan. So the Council of Bishops commissioned a group, the Commission on a Way Forward, to study the issue, talk about the issue, find a way to keep the United Methodist Church united while offering plans for a way forward. That plan came out this summer. The initial plan, the one that was voted on that the majority of the bishops bishops approved was the one church model, which we'll talk about in a minute. That was what went out first. And then they discovered that they actually disagreed on what they agreed they were going to put forward and said, we also want... Uh, she's protesting, it's okay. Uh, and they said, we don't want to just put forward the one plan, we want to put forward three different plans. So now we have three plans that may or may not get voted on at a call to general conference in February of next year. Now, something to be considered. One of these three plans could be put forward. A completely different plan could be put forward and voted on in February. Or they could decide that they don't want to vote or can't vote on anything and nothing changes. But what's going to happen over the next several months is you're going to see, if you follow United Methodist News, you've already seen it, but if you're not up to speed on denominational news, which is thoroughly exciting, I know, um, 
If you're not up to speed on that, you may see a news story on AL.com or CNN or Fox News that says, you know, Methodists vote to approve gay marriage or something like that, which may not give you the fullest sense of what we're, what we're talking about. The point of this session is to give you as much information as we have, but also just let you know where you can look at things and go, well, that's not really what we're talking about. Uh, we've talked about this in the information session, and that's not what that is. The only body that speaks for the entirety of the United Methodist Church is General Conference. That's it. That's the only group that can change any of our wording, any of our doctrine, any of our polities. That's it. So if you see something from such and such bishop or such and such pastor, they're not speaking for the whole church. They're speaking for themselves, for their group, for their feelings uh, related to this issue. It is only by general conference action that you see something that speaks specifically for our denomination as a whole. So, that being said, the three plans that are put forward. Now, I've condensed this into half a page. If you want to come to my office and read the 270 pages of legal language related to these three plans, you are welcome to. I have read every page multiple times, and it is so exciting and thrilling. It's great reading. Um, I want to encourage you to do that, but if you don't, we'll give you the Reader's Digest version here. The one church plan, when you pare it down to its most basic parts, it basically says local churches, local annual conferences will decide for themselves how they will approach the issue of LGBTQ inclusion, same-sex marriage, and ordination. Those are the three primary issues that are at hand. What this means is that they would come down to each annual conference and let them decide for themselves, their board of ordaining ministry, their leadership, to decide whether or not they would ordain gay clergy. Then they would further come down to the local individual churches and say, it's up to you what you want to do. Now, in that, churches can decide that they're going to have a vote, and I can't remember exactly what the majority vote, but it's more than a 51% majority vote. It's a super majority that has to vote for, uh, to, to go either way. When it comes to that, it's the church's choice, meaning uh, the conference, the United Methodist Church, is not going to impose their feelings or their decisions upon the local churches. Um, so if the church as a whole says, we do not want to have gay marriages in our church building, that's going to be respected. If the clergy person that serves said church wants to do gay marriages, but the church says no, they can go do those off-site, but they can't do it in the church. If the clergy person has a moral issue with doing same-sex marriages. They are not compelled to do those marriages. It is a full freedom of choice that's given to the, to the congregations and to the pastors in terms of how they are going to administer their duties and use their building when it comes to uh, this issue. Let's see here. I'm trying to make sure I don't leave anything out. Uh, I think that gives a basic understanding of, of, that, of that plan. The traditionalist plan basically takes our current language, the incompatibility clause, the sacred worth, all those things that I talked about before, and tightens them up. There has been room in our discipline for uh, what you might call civil disobedience. Uh, if a pastor uh, officiated a gay marriage, he or she might... Uh, might get a slap on the wrist and say, don't do it again, and, and, nothing, and nothing changes. Um, and then the other side it might be that they lose their ordination, lose their credentials for violating the discipline. But it depends on where you live, what conference, what part of the United States, what part of the world you live in, what that's going to look like, and you don't know. Um, there are conferences in the United States that have ordained gay clergy. There are conferences that do not uh, bring charges against pastors that perform same-sex unions. It varies greatly. As much as our wonderful country differs is what happens in those churches. We live in the South. 
a much more conservative part of the country, uh, I can tell you that charges against a pastor would be pursued uh, pretty quickly and there would be uh, a very quick comeuppance for a pastor for violating the discipline in the North Alabama Conference. But the, what the traditionalist plan does is it builds in accountability, required punishments for pastors who may, um, who, who may violate the discipline by forming same-sex marriage or pastors that come out as gay or lesbian. Uh, it also um, strengthens the Board of Ordained Ministry, which is the group that uh, puts clergy through uh, and approves clergy to serve and ordains clergy in the United Methodist Church. It gives them more stringent questions that they have to ask each candidate who comes forward for ordination, um, uh, greater, more thorough background checks, searching people's social media. Um, there's, there's a lot more uh, to that. But basically, it, it strengthens the language that's already there and makes mandatory uh, punishments for violations of the discipline. The Connectional Conference Plan is confusing and not <laughs> easy to understand. It requires multiple amendments to our doctrine and polity as United Methodists. Uh, so many amendments that it would be voted on not only at general conference, but come down to each annual conference, which is our geographic area. Um, I don't see any way in heaven's green earth that we're going to ever appro <laughs> approve this plan. But basically, it creates one structure wherein each uh, congregation gets to choose whether they are a part of the progressive United Methodist Church, the Orthodox Methodist Church, or the middle ground United Methodist Church. And somehow we're all still connected, even though we're kind of sub-denominationally connected. It's confusing. I haven't figured it out. I don't think it's going to pass, so I'm not going to tell you anything more about that. But if you'd like to read the giant document, you're welcome to. Um, finally, there is a simple plan that's been put forward by the United Methodist uh, Gay Caucus, which basically removes all the language that came after 1972 about homosexuality and just kind of lets it lie there and gives, gives more freedom. Um, I don't know if that's going to have any chance of going forward or not, uh, but that's another option that's on the table. It's the only other one I've heard uh, that's been put forward in any sort of serious way. So, once again, these are the three plans being put forward. The one church model is the one that was um, affirmed by the Council of Bishops as their approved one to go to general conference. The other two came in afterwards. I, as your pastor, have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know which plan, if any of these plans, are going to be the ones that get put forward. As often happens with uh, political maneuvering and wrangling, which unfortunately is what happens a lot of times at General Conference. We call it worshipful work, but there's a lot of uh, stuff that happens in the background that you never know about. All three of these could be scrapped, and they come up with something completely different that they vote on. So we don't know. Or they could get deadlocked and not vote on any of them. So, your question. No, that was decided back in 2015. Uh, the, the general conference delegates that were elected for the 2016 general conference will go to the one next, next year. Uh, we have, is it, Denise, is it four lay delegates and four? Six. Uh, six. Six, six clergy delegates and six uh, lay delegates. And those are available on the uh, conference website if you wish to let your feelings be known to them about what, you, what you'd like to see happen. Yeah, Yvonne? Um, what are the conditions for the worship that involves the Christians? Because I know that there's some kind of like Christian worship that involves the Christians. Yeah. Um, and then the question The question was, uh, what are the positions of the delegates when it comes to this issue? And it's varied. It is uh, wide and diverse uh, feelings on it from full affirming uh, folks to uh, very traditional folks. And specifically yes, specifically for those coming from our conference. And that's generally true across the board. In the United States, you get a mix of 
uh, what we would call more progressive or liberal and more orthodox or traditional folks uh, that get voted in. Um, the primary difference rests in conferences outside the United States. For instance, uh, Africa as a block votes much more conservative than, uh, than any other part of the world. Excuse me, six lay and six clergy. So six church folks and six pastors. The annual conference, which is our gathering of our geographic area in North Alabama, uh, and that is, um, and they're elected by, again, a group of clerg clergy and laity. Uh, you absolutely can, absolutely. Judy, Judy is our lay delegate, and I am your clergy delegate to annual conference. Uh, typically, the, the delegates who, or the people that put themselves forward to be voted on as a delegate to annual or, excuse me, not annual, to general conference uh, will not say in such bold terms, I am for or against inclusion, but they will use code language within their little bio that gives you a clue. Uh, for instance, I uphold traditional principles of the United Methodist Church, or I uphold traditional doctrine, or I believe that God loves all people. Uh, it, it may not be clear, but the subtext is present in their bio. Yeah. How do we compare this to women in ministry uh, versus inclusion of LGBTQ people? Um, much of the same battle has been going back and forth in terms of understanding what scripture says about these issues. Um, when it comes to women in ministry, you know, Paul has some pretty clear stances when it comes to his feelings and issues with, with women. Um, the difference between the two would really be that there are instances of women in leadership in the early church that you can find in scripture. There are not any that I'm aware of instances where issues related to homosexuality are spoken about positively. So there was a little bit more scriptural push and pull. Now, I say that also acknowledging that I'm married to a wonderful clergy woman and I would love to tell you that all is equal in the church as it is in the world um, but as it is not unequal in the world it's unequal in the church too women still are not treated equally uh, in, in their clergy role they, they have all the same rights but they don't serve the large churches they aren't appointed to the large churches to be senior pastors so there's still a, a, a ways yet to go salary disparity, um, all the issues that are present in our world and our country's economy are present in, in the church economy as well. They did a vote to work toward it. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would love it if it happened next year, but no. <laughs> um, but, th but they acknowledge that it is a problem and are going to seek ways to rectify it. Um, but th they're, the issues that we're coming down to are really issues of um, scriptural authority and also issues of um, social justice and grace. And the two sides disagree on how those things um, and, and which gets more favor and now we are at a point where there is different scriptural interpretation which if you were in the first service we talked about and we'll talk about again in the next service um, 
but we're to the point now where scriptural understanding is different. So at least we're fighting about the same thing, but we're understanding it two different ways. Yes, Ken. Then everything stays the same as it has been. I mean, no, literally, not, nothing, nothing changes. We we uphold the discipline, I believe, as it as it was previously written. Yes, Joe. That's a great. I don't. I don't know if there is a mechanism for that. That that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know if, uh, you know, you have to put your stake in the ground and stick to it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, churches change over time in terms of, uh, especially as culture and, and as the neighborhood around the church changes, it can drastically change. Um, I would imagine there has to be, but I'm not 100 percent sure. And one thing I forgot to mention about both of these plans is that there is an opportunity um, within both, I believe, for churches to make a, a gracious exit from, uh, from the denomination if they so choose, especially in the traditionalist plan. There is an opportunity for churches that wish to be um, more affirming of LGBTQ people, more inclusive, they can exit the denomination, and there's a plan in place to... Um, figure out property issues, which are the biggest issue when it comes to the church, which is one reason the United Methodist Church is not split, is that as much as we may think we have ownership of this building, the deed is held in trust by our conference. So we don't actually own the building. So if half of you get mad at me and half of you are for me, um, you know, you can leave, but you can't take the property with you. Uh, and uh, so that's 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 part of uh, the deal. Yeah, Brenda. How many churches are represented in the general conference? Oh, a lot. Um, <laughs> a, 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 all, all, all the ones that have the United Methodist Church in them, uh, which is which is almost the whole. I mean, it's it's pretty much the whole doggone world at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yvonne. Depends on where you are in the country. Um, <laughs> uh, well, all of those churches have essentially split. Is, is what's is what's happened. The United Methodist Church has not split, um, but Episcopalians are still one group. But you may have noticed that many Anglican churches were formed, which is the more conservative side of the Episcopal Church. Or uh, and there's Presbyterian Churches of America, which is the more conservative side of PC USA. So all of those churches have dealt with some level of split or um, forming of new denominations or, or sister or brother denominations. Did he marry the Lord's person? Yes. And gluttonous people and greedy people, adulterous people. That is a great question, and I think, if I'm honest with you, the United Methodist Church has been so focused on this decision that I don't think they have figured out exactly what comes afterwards if one of these plans gets approved. Um, so I think that's going to be the question of, that's going to come down to district superintendents and, and the conference is, oh, we actually approved something, what do we do now? Um, if I had to guess, I would guess that district superintendents, which are my boss over a geographic area, we're in the northeast district of the North Alabama Conference here uh, at Monsano, that our district superintendent, Tom Parrish, would probably come to the church if we felt that we were ready to vote or decide on something uh, and say, 
all right, we're going to have a whole church meeting. You need to come and, and be a part of this, and we're going to vote this way or that way. Now, the hard part about that is if you do that, you actually have to look in the eyes of the people around you and sit there and go, these people that I love, I'm voting for or against them. And that's going to be... Well, it's both and. Because uh, it's, 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 it's all lumped together in this. Uh, I mean, it's ordination, it's, it's marriage, it's um, full inclusion in the, in the church, it's, it's everything. I think I think that's that's really what they've been fighting over though has been that wording of incompatible Christian teaching and uh, well the the struggle with inclusion and we had a, a district meeting about this where we had several folks for, uh, from around the district come and have conversation the issue is one of where does the line of inclusion and welcome and hospitality end? Um, for our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, I think that there, there is a feeling, whether it is stated or unstated in the church, that they are, they are welcome in, but only so far. There's a, a limit to where, to where that welcome uh, ends. For instance, um, it may be serving in leadership in the church. It may be working with children. It may be um, whatever that line is, that the congregation, whether fully or implicitly stating it, is saying, you can only go to this point. Um, and, our, and our discipline basically says that, is that there is a point at which you can go no further. You may feel called to ministry, but you cannot be ordained in the church. You may feel called to be married to your partner, but you can't marry your partner in the church. Um, so I think that's, that's, the, that's the language that whether we agree or disagree with it, for someone who's coming in who's LGBTQ, they're seeing that they are not fully a part of the church uh, or not offered all of the the opportunities that every person who is part of the church are offered. Sometimes, <laughs> just just being honest. Um, uh, but no, uh, I think that's that's the issue. The other big issue is is this a sin or not a sin? And we have varying viewpoints on that too. And if someone views it as not a sin, then why wouldn't they be ordained? If, it's, if, if in their view, or the view of one half of the population, it's not a sin, then why would they be denied? That would be the core of the discussion, except for the fact that we're talking about polity and doctrine, which requires. But we have separated this one out from all the others.
that is a part of the discussion. There are so many statistical analysis. If you look at uh, Barna or Pew Research, there is a great multitude of different studies about um, the fact that our denomination, really every mainline denomination in the country is in decline and has been for uh, the last 40, even 50 years. We have, we have declined in terms of both our membership and often our worship attendance. Uh, we are losing young people at a rapid clip. Um, and, there, and this is not a one issue thing. I mean, it's not just about LGBTQ people. It is about um, young people viewing the church as hypocrites, as being inward focused instead of outward focused. It's, uh, there's a book called You Lost Me that outlines kind of the top 10 reasons people don't come to church anymore. Um, and number one on that list is the church is anti-gay, um, which unfortunately that is the way that many, chur many churches are viewed. Whether that's true or not, No, it's the number one, excuse me, it's the number one way that the church is described by people 30 and under is anti-gay. Um, I believe it's Barna, uh, the Barna group. But there are a great multitude of reasons why people don't come to church and why we're losing, why we're losing people. The other part is just that we are an aging institution. If you look at Europe, you know, there's a lot of churches that are now Wonderful pubs, because no one goes there anymore. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, 200 years removed uh, or ahead of that group, and we're seeing decline. But as we're seeing decline, we're seeing other parts of the world that are booming in terms of uh, people converting to Christianity. Africa, South America, Asia, those places are exploding with new church growth. But there is, there is no denying that whatever happens with our denomination whatever decision gets made or doesn't get made, there will be some pe people that leave. I mean, there, there's, there is going to be a gut reaction that happens on the other side of February where some people say, it's too traditional, it's too liberal, it's not the church I wanted it to be, it's not what I grew up in, and they will leave. They may go to other United Methodist churches, they may become Baptists, they may become Episcopalian, we don't know. Um, I think the bottom line is no matter what happens, we're, we are going to lose some people from the denomination. Um, I think the important thing is recognizing the fact that a gut reaction is not a good reason to leave a church that you love. And that's one of the things I want y'all to hear is that just because we disagree doesn't mean that we can't love each other. And it doesn't mean that there isn't still space for you in this church, whether one side or the other becomes the prevailing voice in the church, this is still the church you love. These are still the people that you love, your neighbors, your friends. Um, we are not a wholly different place on the other side of what happens in February. We are still the church that you join, that you love, that you care about. So I, I just say that to remind you that just because there is a denominational stance that may or may not change things doesn't mean that this place and these people are different than they were in January, okay? Now, that may mean that we need to have some conversations on the other side of February, absolutely. But my hope is that we would recognize the fact that we disagreed on a lot of stuff before February. <laughs> I mean, we, we, there's all kinds of things we can disagree on. Um, but we're still the church. We're still not saying one methods. And I, I think that's the most important thing. They will gather in is it Minneapolis? I mean, like, yeah, Minneapolis. Uh, all of the delegates will come together there. They will choose to vote on the plan that's presented, the one church plan. They will vote whether or not they will which, which plan they will vote on, and then they will see if they get enough votes for that plan to pass. And again, I've talked to so many different clergy, so many different people, bishops, district superintendents, 
and nobody has a clue how it will go. Eventually, eventually, yeah. There would probably be a rollout plan of how this would happen, meaning that we're going to approve such plan and we're going to implement it over the next such and such months, years kind of thing, but uh, we have not been made privy to that. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Denise, do you remember what, uh, what is the approval vote at General Conference? I can't remember whether it's, it's not, I don't think it's a 51% vote. I think it's like a 60-40 vote or maybe it's two-thirds. Yeah. I'd, 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 have to, I'd have to look it up, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more than a simple majority. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can't even agree to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> We're so deadlocked, yeah. Essentially, yeah, they meet in a giant conference center kind of thing uh, because it's delegates based on membership for each conference is how many delegates you get to, to the conference. So um, it's, a, it's a large, large group gathering. You would think, but yeah. <laughs> Ken, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like a great question, but no. I'm growing up Methodist and growing up Church of Christ, things were very black and white. It was simple truth in the church. It was in the, in the perfect church setting, but it had to go up. Uh uh. I think that no, I think I think that's the that's the that's the question of the day. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think that the issue is very much one that Tom raised is if if you, it's one thing to say I got a divorce and I have repented of that sin and I am now seeking to to move forward in my life. Versus someone who is gay or lesbian who says, this is, this is who I am, and I'm going to continue to seek a committed relationship that's going to be with someone of the same, same sex, same gender. Um, that view that it would be actively sinning, and you're not repenting of it because you're, you're in it. Oh, there, there is an infinite number of, of articles and books on this. Um, some are better than others. We're studying uh, God and the Gay Christian in my current small group, um, which we are discovering is not a very well-written book. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it provides at least a basic understanding of where um, the affirming inclusive side is coming from in the terms of their biblical uh, interpretation. As far as the traditional side, I think that's been pretty well explored for the last 30 years, and there's a multitude of books on that, too. Um, but there's, there, there's lots of books on Bible, gender, uh, sexual. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 
good, good news would be a more conservative view of, of, of the issue. Time for about one more question. Was there one over here that I? Yeah. Spirit of the Cross downtown is offering a class on those particular Bible verses, those six verses that we're actually going to talk about in worship today, um, and kind of going through each one individually um, to talk about how it can be understood uh, in light of traditional but also more affirming language. Well, I think, I think the, the difference for many people is the issue of repentance. And repentance is the idea that we are going to turn away from our sin and change our lives. It doesn't mean that we're never going to sin again, but um, for that viewpoint, you can't turn away and then turn back. <laughs> it's hard to be married and be turning away from your spouse and coming back to them again and again. Uh, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't work. Absolutely. Uh, which, which plan was the closest to the plan when we all joined the United Methodist Church? Uh, <laughs> you signed up probably for the traditionalist plan. I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's the one that is upholding what's currently there and not offering... Uh, choice and change. Uh, yeah. But we've been fighting about it for, since that time too. So <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not that we were all in agreement. It's that the majority voted for that and to uphold it for the last 40 years. So um, 